I'm sure people keep filtering, um, filtering in, but I'll, I'll kick off. So, um, so hi everyone, I'm Alex, and I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you today about two of probably my favorite things in the world, uh, Ruby and Harry Potter. So the title of the talk um, is Ruby as Hagrid, uh, writing Harry Potter with Ruby. And this whole talk is based around a kind of crazy idea. Can we use Ruby, just you know, the regular Ruby language that we know and love, to write a brand new Harry Potter story automatically? So um, this immediately raises some other questions. Uh, like probably the first one is why on earth would we want to do that? Um, then you know what would that actually look like? What can we can we actually achieve if we use Ruby to write a Harry Potter story and? Then the big one, obviously, is how on earth do we actually do this? So let's start with the, the why of why we might want to do this. Um, and I realize I'm probably talking to two kind of slightly different audiences in the room right now. So first you have people like me, the uh, true blue Harry Potter fans. Um, and for, for all of us, this is, this is pretty straightforward. To answer this question, just imagine a nice, big, beautiful pile a brand new Harry Potter books, which means that we can just stay happily in the wizarding world forever. Um, now, there's also going to be a lot of you who've never caught the Harry Potter bug, a bit baffled by it all. Uh, and so for, for all of you instead, um, I'd recommend uh, visualizing a big, beautiful pile of money, because uh, that is what awaits you if you can sort of satiate the rabid hunger of people, people like me in category A. Um, by the way, if you're not quite sure which category you fit into, um, there's a little test I've come up with. Um, just look at this picture, um, and then based on your reaction, um, you can sort yourself into the, uh, <laughs> into the appropriate category. Um, okay, so, so those are some of the whys. Um, maybe some slightly more, more serious reasons why, why hopefully this is, this is interesting. Um, it's going to give us a nice intro to at natural language processing, NLP, uh, which, is, which is really a hot topic right now. Um, it's also, I think, going to reveal a lot of like, the simplicity and beauty and elegance of Ruby. Um, we can actually you know, do this with, with very little Ruby code. Um, and, and also, I hope it's going to re reveal something more general about tackling seemingly hard problems. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. OK, so now what can we achieve? What will this actually look like when it's done? Um, so I'm going to give a bit of a spoiler and show that the output of, of the sort of final program that we'll write. Um, so let's give it a read. Uh, Neville, Seamus, and Dean were muttering, but did not speak when Harry had told Fudge mere weeks ago that Malfoy was crying, actually crying tears, streaming down the sides of their heads. <laughs> they revealed a spell to make your bludger, said Harry, anger rising once more. OK, so it's definitely not you know, Pulitzer Prize winning stuff. Um, but, you know, it has, uh, you know, it, it more or less makes sense. It certainly has the style of a Harry Potter story. And, and hopefully you'll be sort of doubly impressed when you see actually how little code um, goes into to making this. Um, so now the big one is, is how we actually go about doing this. And on the face of it, this, this does seem like quite a hard problem, right? To look at even, you know, one sentence from that extract that I just read. Um, and think about, well, how do we begin writing Ruby code to create a sentence like this? So there are a couple of key, in, um, uh, key ideas that, that I want to introduce to sort of help get us started. So one is that we want to tell this story word by word. So at any point, we just want to be focused on generating the next word in the story. And the second key idea is that probably Pretty much every, all of us in this room have a great source of inspiration for this problem um, in our pockets or in our bags, and those are our smartphones. So why are our smartphones a, a good way to get started on this problem? So pretty much every modern smartphone has, uh, see if I can use my laser pointer, has one of these, right, a predictive keyboard. Um, now, usually we use a predictive keyboard as a sort of typing aid, right, to, to write things faster. But what's kind of interesting is we can actually use this to um, generate sentences basically unsupervised. So here's a video I recorded on my phone. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just hammering this middle suggestion button. And you can see what happens 
is it starts to generate you know, an English sentence, you know, a sentence that sounds like it's been written by a human. Um, and you know, what else is kind of interesting about this is it's not supposed to just be imitating any human, it's supposed to be imitating me because, uh, you know, and some of you might know this already, your predictive keyboard adapts to you over time, right? So it sort of learns your style and tries to imitate that. So how does your phone do this? Well, so let's take an example. This is what I get as my suggestions when I type birthday into my phone. So um, the first suggestion is party followed by cake and then we have wishes as the third suggestion. So somewhere in the memory of my phone, it knows that you know, out of all the times that I've written birthday, let's say that I've used the word party 30 times to follow on from birthday and cake a little less, 20 times, let's say. And so by knowing what words I've used in the past, it can suggest um, what words I'm, I'm likely to want to use in, in this instance when I've written birthday. So why is this relevant to our problem? Well, we can take that exact same idea and start doing the same thing with the way that J.K. Rowling uses language in the Harry Potter series. So for example, um, the word golden appears about 200 times in the Harry Potter books. And these are the, tops, the, the top continuations um, that come after golden. So um, the word egg is the, the word that follows golden most often. And that, that comes 13 times after, after golden. And then snitch is the next most common, and so on. Um, and a, a couple of bits of terminology I'll, I'll keep using throughout this talk. Um, this initial word that we use to sort of generate the suggestions, we'll call this the head word. And these suggestions, we'll call them continuation. So the third key idea is that we want to break the way we tackle this problem into two phases. First, we want to learn um, the style of J.K. Rowling, learn the style of the Harry Potter books. And the second step is we want to then use everything we've learned to generate new stories. So let's first look at the learning stage. Now, the learning stage is actually super simple. All we want to do is basically um, look at every single word that J.K. Rowling uses in the Harry Potter books and just collect these sort of stats. Yeah? So for each head word, what are the continuations that come after it? And uh, how many times does each continuation appear? Um, so we do it for golden, as we saw, but then for goldfish and golf. And for all the words in the books, that's about 20,000 unique words altogether. Um, so how would we represent this in Ruby? Well, you can maybe guess from the way this, this is laid out that a nice way to represent it is just as a simple Ruby hash, right? So something like this is what we want to end up with. Okay, so let's look at how we, we actually do this in code. So the very first thing that we're going to need is um, some uh, 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 copies of the books in machine-readable format. So just text format is, is completely fine. Oh, I forgot to mention, by the way, I, I've put some notes and all the slides and everything um, online, and um, you can find links to these kind of text files there. Um, and I'll show that link again at the end. So we start with those, those text files, and then we, we want to start by doing some cleaning. So something called tokenization, which basically means um, you know, getting rid of special characters, we'll lowercase everything. Um, we'll turn everything into a symbol as well. That's going to be a lot more memory efficient to work with. So um, taking a sentence like this, we'll end up with, with some output like, like this. So once we've tokenized everything, then we're ready to actually build up our, um, our hash of the head words and the continuations. And this is a really nice example, I think, of, as I said, how elegant and simple Ruby can make this. So th this is all the code that we need to, to do this. So let's have a look at what's going on here. So um, we start off by using this nice built-in method, each cons, which is short for each consecutive. And that's basically going to take each consecutive, in this case, because we've passed the argument to, each consecutive pair of words. Um, and so we'll start with the cat, and then we'll do cat sat, sat on, and so on. Um, and then for, um, for each uh, head word, we're going to say, um, OK, if we haven't encountered this head word before, let's just initialize a new hash um, inside. So um, to go along with, say, our head word the, we'd start with a, a new hash, which will have a default uh, count of 0. And then we'll just say, OK, for this combination of head word and continuation, let's increment the count by, by 1. So that's, that's all that's going on here. And uh, the first iteration, uh, you can see we'll get the, and we'll say, OK, cat follows the word the one time. And then on the next iteration, sat followed cat one time. And we'll continue uh, iterating through all the words in this example sentence, and we'll eventually end up with something like this. Yeah. So we do exactly the same procedure 
but instead of this example sentence, we do it on that, that corpus of all the Harry Potter books, and that's our learning phase done. That's all we have to do to learn the style of the Harry Potter books, J.K. Rowling. So now we need to figure out how we uh, use that to generate new stories. Um, and there are a few different approaches. So let's start with the simplest, which is called the greedy algorithm. Okay. So wh why is it called the greedy algorithm? Um, well, it's because in each case, it sort of takes the biggest, juiciest option. Uh, so what that means is it just goes for the most likely continuation, the one that's appeared most often. So in our golden example, remember we said egg appeared more than any other word after golden 13 times. So we would just always pick the word egg after the word golden. Okay, um, so, um, and then, you know, once we pick egg, well, after egg, the word and is the most frequent continuation, so we pick that one next, and we just continue on like that until, until we have a story. Um, this, again, is really nice and easy to implement in Ruby. So, um, uh, you can see here what we're doing is we're, we're taking all of our continuations, and we've got the word and the count, how many times it appears, and then we're just using the max by method to say, just give me the continuation with the highest count. Yeah, and that's, that's all we're doing, really nice and easy. Okay, so uh, if, you're, um, if you've really been paying attention, then um, you're spotted one other problem, which is, well, what do we do about our very first word in the story, right? Because uh, when we're doing our first word, we don't have any previous word to continue from, so we're gonna have to do something a little different to start our story. There's, there's a bunch of different approaches, um, but in this case, we can just uh, start with a completely random word. Yeah, so any random word in our vocabulary, that's what's happening here when I'm, I'm using the dot sample method, just pick a random word to start us off. And then, in this case, I'm gonna make a 50-word story, so I'm just gonna repeatedly apply the greedy algorithm, um, and then word by word, hopefully build up a story. Okay. So how does this work in practice? So um, I ran this for the first time, and this is what I ended up with. Oh no, said Harry. A few seconds later, they were all the door and the door and the door and the door and the door. <laughs> okay. Hmm. So this is not a great start, um, but maybe I, maybe I just got unlucky, right? Remember, we start with a random word, uh, so maybe this was just a really bad choice. Let, let me try it again. Uh, so this is my second attempt. Surreptitiously, <laughs> several of the door and 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 the door. Okay, so, so the good news is um, we won't struggle to find a title for our new Harry Potter story. Um, the, uh, the bad news is, is obviously pretty much everything else. So, um, so obviously something's gone, gone horribly wrong here. Um, what, what's going on? Um, so let's look and walk through what's, what's actually happening here as we're running this. Well, so let's say we start with the word several. Well, the word that appears most often after the word several is the word of. The word that appears most often after of is the. And then after the, the most common continuation is door. And after door is and. Okay, all good so far. But then the problem is that the most common word that comes after and is the, right? So you can see what happens is we get, we get stuck in a loop. Um, and you might be wondering, does this, does this always happen? Uh, and sadly, the answer is yes. Um, weirdly enough, the, um, the word that gives us the longest story without going into a loop is actually conference. Um, <laughs> you can't make these things up sometimes. Um, and this is what we get if we use our greedy algorithm with, 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 the, uh, with the start word conference. Um, and this is the best we can do, 20 words, right? So obviously, we can rule out our greedy algorithm and say this, this simply doesn't work. Okay, so let's try a completely different approach to generation. Um, let's go to the opposite end of the scale, and let's just get really random with something called the uniform random algorithm. Uh, it's a, a, a fancier name uh, than, you know, it's a fancy name for something that's extremely simple. Basically, what we do is we just look at our potential continuations, and we just pick anyone randomly, right? With equal probability, we just draw one out of, out of a hat. So, you know, in this case, if we had three continuations, we pick one of the three with equal probability, one third of probability of picking any of them. Um, in reality, we'll probably have a lot of continuations. So in this case, we have 117 potential continuations after golden. We just pick one of them randomly. Okay, so again, really nice and easy to do in, um, in Ruby. We can just, again, use the dot sample method, and that will just pick one of our continuations at random. Um, okay, so how does this work in practice? So uh, here's an example. Um, Debris from boys or accompany him bodily from Ron, yelled the waters. 
Harry laughing together soon further, which then bleated the smelly cloud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's prob probably better than the greedy algorithm, but um, it's, it's probably, uh, unless you're really into you know, avant-garde Harry Potter fan fiction, this is probably <laughs> like a little bit, a little bit weird. Um, why is this, uh, and the other thing I would say as well is, apart from the names, um, this doesn't really seem like Harry Potter, right? If you took the names out, you'd never guess this was, this was a Harry Potter story. Um, so why, why is that? Why isn't this working so well? Well, th there's a lot of reasons, but um, let's look at one example word here. So let's look at the word house. Um, so after the word house in the Harry Potter series, the word elf appears over 100 times. Um, uh, but it's just one of those 200 potential continuations after house has a one in 200 chance of being picked. Um, by the way, a house elf is, is like our friend Dobby um, from, from earlier, if you didn't know. Um, the word prices does appear. The, word, the phrase house prices appears in Harry Potter, but only appears once. Um, but this has exactly the same chance of being picked as house elf, right? So obviously, um, a program that's as likely to talk about house prices as house elves isn't really doing a very good job of, of imitating Harry Potter. So that gives us some clues about how we can improve this. And so our final and best algorithm is what we call the weighted al random algorithm. So what we do here is we just, we just solve this problem, right? So we look at the, um, the situation here, and the word house appears about 700 times in the series altogether, and 100 of those times, it's, um, it, it, it's followed by um, elf. So logically, it feels like, well, there should really be more like a one in seven chance of being picked, right? Um, and this is exactly what this algorithm does. So we just rescale the probabilities, so it matches how many times the word appears. Um, so again, this is surprisingly easy. Uh, oh, sorry, um, so just to reinforce that point, so uh, you might end up with a situation like this, where the uh, most frequent continuation would have a higher probability, let's say one half probability of being picked, um, and then you know, one third, one sixth, and so on. So again, surprisingly easy to implement in Ruby. Um, so this one's maybe slightly more difficult to understand, but um, the intuition here is, you know, you can think of this like a raffle, where um, a word, each word gets an entry um, equal to the number of times it appears. So in our house elf example, elf gets 100 entries to the raffle, whereas prices only gets one entry to the raffle. That's what this, uh, this times here is doing. You get one ticket uh, for every time uh, you appear. Here, the, the series, and then again, you just, you just draw from that raffle using the sample. Um, so this is the weighted random algorithm. Um, let's see how this does. It's bringing forward as though they had quite a grip. You stand blindly retorting Harry's pumpkin tart. Okay, so it's still pretty weird, but it's starting to evolve. It's starting to, to feel more like a real Harry Potter story. So how do we make that last jump and, and prove this um, to, uh, to match what we saw at the beginning? There's one last big idea here on generation, which is to revisit up our predictive key order. There's actually something more interesting going on here. Because if I just start by typing quit and into my phone, I get these kind of fairly generic suggestions to you in mind. But if I type in something like fish and, um, then my phone knows to offer up different suggestions, right? So that's the first thing you get to do. Um, so obviously, my phone isn't just looking at the previous word, it's actually looking at more of the history than that. So the last key idea is that we can improve our output by looking at more than just the previous word. So, um, so what that means is rather than building up that hash like this with every word and its continuations, now we're going to want to build a hash. Uh, sorry, when we do this, we're only we're only ever thinking about two words: one head word, one continuation. This is what we call a diagram. One diagram means two words. Um, so instead, we're going to um, want to look at every unique pair of words in the book series and all of the continuations of that word. And this is the, this, in this case, we're thinking about three words at a time, so this is a trigram model. We could actually extend this to a four-gram model, a five-gram model, and so on. Now, obviously, because we're thinking of unique pairs of words, there's a lot more, right? So I think we said 20,000 unique words, um, but we have about 300,000 unique pairs of words. So a lot bigger than actually we're building, but this will still um, compute 
so stepping back for a second, we've seen that this problem that at the start maybe, at least some of you I imagine, seemed like quite a complicated idea, like it would be quite difficult. We've actually managed to do this in like 20 lines of pretty short, pretty readable Ruby code. Um, and I, I wanted to, to kind of take this opportunity to, to, to just finish off by, by talking about um, having just some broader lessons we can draw from this. Obviously, hopefully this is an interesting, inspiring project, but you know, how do you actually you know, apply this to your, to your general class as coders? So, on the surface, this, this talk is about Harry Potter. But someone pointed out to me afterwards that they thought it was also about another PHP, and it was also about hard problems, right? How you can take a problem that looks really hard on the surface, and then by the time you finish the solution, you're like, oh, that was actually a lot easier than I thought. <laughs> so, I think hard problems are relevant to all of us. So, if you're, you know, a, a new programmer, then you know, tapping the first hard problem can be really intimidating. But even if you're a veteran programmer, I think it's really important to reflect on how to solve hard problems. So the first tip is, is really, you know, when you're tackling a new hard problem, ask someone familiar with the problem, what are the building blocks for solving this problem? How do we tackle this one step at a time? How do we break it down? So the second lesson to take is that we should really pay attention to our failures. So um, obviously we, we had a, a bit of a, a false start uh, when we were, we were telling our stories. Now we could have just said, oh, you know, that doesn't work. Let, let's throw it away and try something different. Um, but what I really had to do is, is look in detail at the failure, try and figure out, well, why did that fail? You know, map out what was happening at every step and working out where the problem was, because that was then what yielded the solution, what yielded the next step. So, um, you know, it may sound obvious, but anytime you're tackling, especially a really hard problem, just really pay attention to those, those failures. Um, and ask, you know, ask someone who knows again about the problem domain, why didn't this work? What specifically about my approach was flawed? And then the last uh, lesson to draw is that finding a good metaphor for a problem is actually really, really valuable. So uh, when I was you know, wrapping my head around this, I found this metaphor of the um, predictive keyboard to be really, really helpful in understanding how to go about this. 
Now, um, it's really easy to come up with bad metaphors, but coming up with good metaphors is much more tricky. And I think a good metaphor has a couple of qualities. So the first is that it, it keeps and captures all the essential parts of the problem. So you can strip out things that aren't, um, you know, that aren't relevant, and you can modify things, but there are certain essential parts of the problem that you just have to keep. And the second thing is that a good metaphor allows you to sort of play around with the metaphor um, and then learn something about the original problem, right? So it's not just a way of understanding the problem, but it's like you can actually make progress on solving the problem by playing around with the metaphor. So let's take another example of this that I really, really like. So uh, let's say I'm Dumbledore and I'm trying to uh, schedule the Hogwarts classes. Now I have to schedule the classes um, so that um, there aren't any clashes. So if you know, a student is taking two classes, they shouldn't be scheduled at the same time. But I do want my timetable to be efficient. So if I can schedule two classes at the same time, I want to do it. Um, so for example, here's a bad example of the scheduling. Um, so in this case, hopefully you can see the colors. Um, I've scheduled arithmancy and ancient runes at the same time, so the same color. Um, but you know, Hermione's taking both of them, so this is a, this is a, a failed attempt at scheduling. So um, I can definitely look at this in the tabular form, and it works OK. But there's a sort of nice metaphor, a nice different way of thinking about this, um, which is uh, graph coloring, which some of you might know about. So basically what I do is I just draw out the classes as um, dots on a piece of paper or whatever. And then if two students are, uh, or sorry, if a student is taking two classes, the same student is taking two classes, I just draw a line between the dots. So for example, remember we said uh, Hermione is taking ancient runes and arithmancy. So these two have a, have a line between them. And then basically my challenge is I've got to color in the dots so that at the, uh, at the ends of a line, um, I don't end up with the same color ever, okay? So, um, and so for example, this is uh, an example of a valid coloring. And what's interesting about this is if I can come up with a valid coloring, I've also come up with a valid timetable. Uh, so it may take some thinking about, but if you reason this through, you'll realize these are actually equivalent problems. Uh, if, you can, if you can do the coloring with the lines in between them, then you've eliminated all of the conflicts and you have a valid timetabling. Now, I absolutely love this metaphor because, yeah, sure, we can look at things in the tabular form, but you know, having this metaphor to draw on, we can actually start playing around with this. We can get a piece of paper and a pen and some coloring pencils and start making progress on this. And it keeps all the essential parts of the original problem. So everything I learn by playing around with that metaphor, I can apply to that original hard problem. So again, find somebody who knows about this, this problem domain and ask them what's a good metaphor for this problem. And as I said, you know, favor anything where it's something you can physically play around with on, on pencil, you know, something you can play around with, with pen and paper or a physical object or something like that. It's really, really helpful. Okay, so yeah, that, those are the kind of key lessons um, about hard problems that I think that, that certainly I learned from, from doing this talk. Um, so yeah, just thank you for listening. I've put the slides and notes online uh, at this address. Um, and I, I think we're cutting quite uh, short for time, so I won't take questions now, but feel free to, to come up to me afterwards if you have any. All right, thanks very much.